Welcome, ladies. We are here today to talk about the fertility awareness method, and I have Ashley Annis with me. Uh, I'm going to just do a little uh, spiel on what we're going to talk about today, and then I'm going to introduce Ashley to all of you, and uh, and then we're going to go from there. She's going to enlighten us on uh, this amazing method of birth control and uh, fertility achievement. So uh, I know that a lot of you probably have a lot of questions. I know I did before I was introduced to the concept of fertility awareness. Uh, I know, again, a lot, of, a lot of the time we have all of these issues that come up throughout the month and we don't really know why they're happening or what, what they're all about. So uh, for me, there are many times where I noticed spotting at different times in my cycle and I had no idea what was going on or cervical fluid. There were times where I thought I had an infection and I didn't know why uh, cervical fluid looked different throughout the month. Uh, sometimes I felt a sharp pain in my side and I was totally freaked out by that. And, uh, and then there were times where there were breast lumps and I couldn't figure that one out either. So a lot of these experiences caused me a lot of panic and I'm sure they've caused a lot of you panic at some point in your lives as well but they can actually be really normal occurrences if they take place at the appropriate time in your cycle. And so knowing when you're ovulating is, uh, is not only good, obviously, when you're trying to conceive and have a baby, that it's actually very important for when you're trying to not do that. Uh, sperm can actually live in your body for up to five days, and an unfertilized egg can only live for up to 48 hours. So after that, the perfect conditions have passed and then your body prepares to release the egg. Uh, as you can see, this is not a very big window of opportunity for those who are trying to conceive, but on the flip side, for those who are not, it's a gigantic window of opportunity. So again, it, it's different for all of us, but um, Ashley's gonna explain a lot of all of this today. So today we're gonna talk a lot about these issues. We're gonna address them. And I just wanna give a quick disclaimer that this is you know, just a 60 minute introduction to the fertility awareness method and you should not attempt to use it as birth control after this call. It takes a, long, a lot longer to understand all the nuances of it. So what I would suggest is contacting Ashley directly after our call and she's gonna be happy to assist you with learning how to use the method properly. Uh, we'll have her, all of her contact information at the end of the presentation. So now I wanna introduce Ashley Annis. She is a fertility awareness educator and she's going to teach you today the basics on what the fertility, sorry, fertility awareness method is and how, uh, and how to start using it or implementing it in your life. So Ashley. Hi. Hi. So um, as Nicole said, my name's Ashley. I've been studying fertility awareness for about a year now and charting my own cycles for about two years. Um, I self-taught with um, Tony Weschler using her book, Taking Charge of Your Fertility. Um, and when I found out about it, I was just blown away that nobody had ever told me about fertility awareness before, that I, I had never heard that it was an option. I always thought I would have to go on the pill at some point, um, and that just didn't feel right. So I did some searching online, found um, a few books, and um, then when I heard about the teacher training program that I'm involved in now, I just jumped at the chance. So, um, again, as Nicole said, this is just an intro class. Don't go and try and use this as birth control after today, but um, definitely contact me if you want more information. So I guess we can get started. Absolutely. Let's do it. I know we don't have a lot of time. I know the ladies on here are ready to go. <laughs> a lot of info for a, a lot of, bit of time. I know it is, definitely. <laughs> okay, so the first thing is lots of people ask me this all the time, and I'm sure you get it way more. Uh, mm -hmm. the fertility method. Isn't that just another version of the rhythm method? And uh, right. I know you get that a lot. So maybe you can tell us what it is, what the, what the difference is, and maybe what what the fertility awareness method is and how it differs. Sure. So the rhythm method is super outdated, and it was originally um, conceived for uh, like the Catholic birth control because obviously they don't um, do other types of birth control. So mm -hmm. it was based on the assumption that every woman ovulates on day 14 of her cycle. And if you think about that, just intuitively, that seems kind of off anyway. Mm -hmm. um, but that was the assumption. And so like Nicole was saying, you just have a small fertile window and then the rest of the cycle uh, you're infertile. Um, but if, if you're not basing 
your uh, ovulation day on the correct day, then you know you, if you have intercourse, you can definitely get pregnant if you ovulated later or earlier. Um, so that's why the rhythm method doesn't work. Fertility mm -hmm. awareness, on the other hand, uses like real-time fertility signal charting. So you're charting what's actually going on in your body and not just assuming that you're going to ovulate on day 14. Right. That makes sense. I mean, because um, women, t what is the, what are, what's the typical window for, for ovulation for most women? I mean, like days um, so, from day to day. Sure. Menstruation will last like five to seven days. And then um, like if, if, it, if it was a normal textbook type of cycle, you'd have like a four or five day kind of fertile window building up with cervical fluid, then you'd ovulate around day 14. But if you're traveling, if you're sick, if you're stressed out, your mm -hmm. body takes into consideration these kinds of things and it'll push back ovulation because it knows you're not ready to have a child if, you know, if stuff's going on crazy in your life. So it'll push back ovulation and then um, you won't ovulate till later in your cycle. Right. I mean, my understanding for most women is that we ovulate anywhere between days 12 and day 17 of our cycles. Sure. And that's yeah. still considered normal. Yeah. Right. That's what I thought. Okay. And so, um, so with fertility awareness, maybe you can just say how it differs, differs from the rhythm method in, in what we're looking for. As far as the fertility oh, in terms of, yeah, in terms of like what like what's in terms of uh, ovulation day and um and cervical fluid and all that kind of stuff because the rhythm sure. method we don't really look for cervical fluid, do we? Right, right. With the rhythm method, you're only counting days. That's the only charting that happens. With the fertility awareness method, you're going to be charting your BBT, um, mm -hmm. which is your basal body temperature or waking temperature, and then also your cervical fluid patterns, um, which we can get into a little bit later. Yeah, definitely. Um, and then there's also a ton of secondary fertility signs that a lot of women will chart as well. Okay. Yeah, I know. There's, I mean, there's quite a few signs that's so funny. Nobody, nobody really knows about them. So we're going to get into all of that in just a little bit. Okay. So now I want to talk a little bit about why we love the fertility awareness method. Uh, I'll say that I've been doing this now for two and a half years and it's been quite life changing for me. And, uh, and I know for you, Ashley, it was as well when you first discovered yep. it. So maybe tell us a little bit about what it is and, and, you know, what's so great about it. Sure. So, um, one of the biggest things is it, it's, it's eco-friendly. Um, you're not putting any hormones into your body. There's no risk of putting any of those hormones into our waterways or anything like that. Um, you're not using any packaging like the birth control pills come in. Uh, there's no latex waste for condoms, anything like that. It's um, completely 100% natural, hormone-free. Um, it costs only as much as your thermometer. And then, of course, if you're going to take a class, that's um, just a one-time cost as well, but um, you're not paying for birth control every time you want to use it. Yep, it's also hugely important for monitoring your gynecological health. Um, so not only can you prevent our teeth pregnancy with it, but if something kind of wonky is going on with your cycle, you're going to know it before it becomes a bigger problem. Yeah. Um, and it's also just totally empowering knowing exactly where you are in your cycle, whether or not you're fertile, and then taking the steps um, that you need to take to either, um, you know, make yourself healthier or prevent pregnancy. Um, the control is all in your hands. And that's what I love so much about fertility awareness. Yeah, I could not agree with you more. Like what I was saying initially about understanding and monitoring your health. I, you know, there, I've been had so many conversations with my doctor, uh, about, about my own health individually. And, it's amazing when you can have that educated, empowered, like you said, discussion with your doctor rather than looking to your doctor to fix you when something is wrong. Uh, I find that I was able to, I've been able to sort of self-diagnose and, uh, exactly. and, under, yeah, and understand what's been, what's happening long before there ever is an issue. So mm -hmm. I love that part. I just love that aspect of it. Well, and if it gets to the point where you do need to go see a doctor, you have months worth of charts that you can take in, and that's an incredible tool for the doctors to use as well. Yeah, absolutely. That's the other thing as well. I mean, I think that the doctor would really appreciate it. Absolutely. Yes. Okay. So that explains that. 
And now I want to talk a little bit with you about the four phases of the menstrual cycle and how we're affected on a physical level during each of these phases. So maybe you can start to tell us a little bit about that. Sure. So if you have the GoToMeeting um, screen share up right now, you can see there's a little chart. It's got uh, estrogen, progesterone, um, and then the bottom half is the the egg follicle. And you can see there's a, a t bunch of tiny little ones, then it grows. The black line in the middle is ovulation, so that's the little egg breaking out of the follicle. Um, and then you see the, the green splotches, and we'll get to that in just a minute. So. Um, the first half of the cycle on the left hand side is the follicular phase. So that includes menstruation during your bleeding time and then um, the half of the cycle that's after menstruation and before ovulation. Um, and you can see estrogen kind of uh, dominates that half of the cycle. You can see it rising up um, to ovulation and in conjunction with a few other hormones, um, that's what kind of pushes the egg out at ovulation. Um, so it can be ready to be fertilized. Um, mm. So estrogen does a couple really awesome things. It um, it grows the follicles. So as you can see, there's a bunch of little ones. Then one egg will eventually emerge as dominant. And then that egg will continue to grow um, and get ready for ovulation. And it also does something really awesome um, in our bodies. In our cervix, we have these tiny little things called cervical crypts. And estrogen kind of stimulates those to start producing cervical fluid, which is the main charting piece of fertility awareness. That's going to give you the most information about where you are in your cycle. Um, I have a question and then you can you. see, really sure, go ahead. Yeah, um, the cervical crypt, that's really cool. Uh, but my, well, maybe I'm getting ahead of myself, but with uh, the cervical fluid, I had always thought it was your temperature that was the main charting tool. So how come you're saying that it's the cervical fluid? Like why sure. is that more so temperature um, temperature is really important for the second half and then for the like the cross check we'll okay. get into that in a little bit during the luteal phase um, you'll see that your temperature rises and that's a really good indication that you've ovulated as far as the cervical fluid goes and why I think it's the most important piece is because um, temperature can kind of change depending on a few different variables. Mm -hmm. If you wake up too late, your temperature yeah. will go up. Um, if you drank a lot the night before, say, for instance, um, if you're sick. Um, also, batteries, if you have a digital thermometer, if your batteries are going dead, that can, you know, screw up your temperature. Um, mm. If you're camping, your thermometer is really cold, your temperature will be lower. Um, <laughs> just oh, a ton of, of different things. Okay. <laughs> sure. um, with cervical fluid though, your body is, your body won't like change depending on what time you wake up or where you are or anything like that. It's always going to tell you exactly what is going on. I see. Okay. That makes yeah. sense. All right, yeah. carry on. I switched to the next slide so that we could talk more about what's happening. But maybe we want the sure. image, so we'll just go back to the image. Okay. <laughs> yeah, make it easy. Um, yeah, so estrogen causes the follicles to grow, and then ovulation occurs um, down at the bottom again. So you have your little pink follicle that the egg was growing in, and then after ovulation occurs, that follicle turns into a completely different little thing called the corpus luteum, which means yellow body. And mm. it does this really awesome thing where it emits progesterone, which is the red line, you see. And that's the dominating hormone for the luteal phase, which is the second half of the cycle. Um, and as we said before, progesterone raises your body temperature. So you'll see that on your chart. And um, it also prevents the body from ovulating a second egg. So that's another huge piece of why fertility awareness works is because progesterone won't let you ovulate a second time. So that's why intercourse is safe during the luteal phase. Ah, right. Yeah, our bodies are kind of amazing. They're so it's awesome. Unbelievable <laughs> what they do. There's so many checks and balances. That's what I can't get over. Yep. Yeah, it's yeah. Got, they've got all bases covered pretty much. <laughs> Definitely. So that's what you were saying then. So progesterone rises and that's what uh, causes our temperature to rise, essentially. Mm -hmm. Right. Okay. All right. Um, so that pretty much covers, I guess, what is happening in our bodies on a physical level. By the way, I didn't mention this in the beginning. If anybody has any questions at all, feel free to type them into your chat box. We'll take questions as they come in. I'm monitoring them. So if there are any questions at all, please don't hesitate to ask them. Uh, we're open to anything. And we'll take 
questions towards the end too if you also want to uh, wait till the end so that's yeah okay all right let's keep going so this was my, my more uh detailed chart of of what's going on and again it, it essentially uh it represents the same thing it just had a couple of different uh aspects to it it had the uterine cycle so some people as yeah, you can see at the great. bottom it's the yeah it's a good one right so i know down at the bottom yeah yeah, it's more. I feel like it was just it was helpful for people to see to see more of. Oh, and it's of got what's the body happening. temperature. So the second from the top is yeah. your body temperature too. Yeah, exactly. Very cool. Yeah. So, um, and of course, all of it corresponds with each other. So it, it made sense to to use that as well. If, if anybody didn't understand what was happening, um, but I feel like we pretty much covered all of that. Like, uh, what people didn't see in the other one was the pituitary hormones, the luteinizing and the follicle stimulating hormone. Those uh, also work in conjunction with estrogen and progesterone uh, to get that egg out. <laughs> so yep. those ones, yeah, of course. So those ones are there as well. And then everything else is pretty straightforward. So we'll move on and just continue to discuss. So tracking your cycle using fertility awareness. Uh, I always, I love this chart. Like, and it's something we just address. And it's what Tony uh, says in the book, Taking Charge of Your Fertility, which is all about the fertility awareness method. And she says, women who chart are so aware of what is normal for themselves that they can help their doctor literally determine irregularities based on their own cycles rather than an average woman's symptoms. And that's like what I, I talk a lot about with my clients is that, you know, we're in this age now of moving away from this sort of industrialized medicine and doing more of the individualistic medicine because the one size fits all clearly does not work, especially for women's right. bodies. And so this is such an amazing tool for you to use for that specific purpose, I think. Definitely. Body literacy is a term that we use a lot in our class. And I love, I love that. that image. Yeah, being yeah. literate of what your body's doing. So Absolutely. That is so cool. It, yeah, I, I could not agree with you more. I love that term. I'm totally going to steal it from you. <laughs> <laughs> Do it. <laughs> okay, awesome. All right, so here we go. What exactly does tracking your cycle involve? You can... Elaborate sure. For us. So here's the two pieces again that we were just talking about a little bit. Charting your cervical fluid. I love this little picture with the lazy undies. <laughs> I know. <it's laughs> and uh, taking your basal body temperature each day of your cycle. Those are mm. the biggies. That's and, what will be on your charts. Yes. <laughs> what? And so tell. Maybe you can tell everyone what a basal body temperature is. Maybe some people are on who don't know. Sure. So it's your waking body temperature. It's the first thing you need to do when you wake up. Don't get up, run to the bathroom. Don't open your blinds. Don't write down your crazy dreams that you had last night. You take your BBT right away because all of those things are going to raise your body temperature and you want the most accurate reading. Right. Okay. And so, right. So it's literally the thing that, because it, it'll literally change within half an hour to an hour, right? Of not taking, yep. of waking For up. For supplement. And, not and actually, for me, at least, I can sit up and move around a little bit, and my temperature is usually okay if I take it. And, and some mm -hmm. women, that works. Um, you might have to experiment a little bit. But in general, I tell women to just take it right away first thing. Yeah, no, that makes complete sense. Okay. I just realized that this one, the temperature is in Celsius. <laughs> that image there. <laughs> I know. It's all good. <laughs> okay. So charting your cervical fluid. Now I guess you can go into all of that because I think that this is the most mysterious part for a lot of women. Yeah, absolutely. Mm -hmm. And it takes the most practice and it takes the most time. Yeah. Um, and it also takes maybe like the highest comfort level too. A lot of women are kind of squeamish and, you know, maybe a little bit uncomfortable with the idea of charting their cervical fluid. Um, and it, it makes sense in the culture that we're in, you know, we don't really like to see or touch or deal with that kind of stuff. So mm -hmm. um, we have here on the, on the viewing screen, cervical fluid changes throughout your cycle. It starts out dry after your period, and then it becomes more wet and creamy as ovulation approaches. Um, it becomes viscous like egg white. After ovulation, it becomes thicker, and then it'll eventually get dry again in preparation for menstruation. Um, so a lot of women will notice a pattern after menstruation um, that they're cervical fluid will start out kind of like sticky, almost like pasty or glue, like it's like a drier fluid. Mm -hmm. um, and water content is really the big thing that you want to look for when you're charting your cervical fluid. Um, so if you see like kind of a dry, sticky fluid, that's not a super fertile quality fluid. 
and as we move closer to ovulation, it'll become really wet, slick, stretchy. Um, so for some women, it's like almost water, like right. it, it becomes that wet. Um, and so that's when you know you're kind of at the height of your fertility. Um, okay. And then after ovulation, it'll um, have like a drying up pattern. And some women will also experience um, what I chart as a luteal mucus. So your follicular phase is the first half. Then your luteal phase is the second half. And um, like a luteal mucus will be almost kind of like the beginning of the cycle where it's sticky. Um, it's more like like a pastier, creamier sort of thing. A lot of times the egg white fertile, or fertile cervical fluid will be really like clear or uh, streaked almost. And the luteal mucus will be um, like opaque. You won't be able to see through it. Right. So that, uh, yeah, I was going to say that definitely happens to me. And so... I've mm -hmm. read that there is an estrogen spike uh, or a little bit of an estrogen spike in the luteal phase. Uh, in, and it's apparently preparing our bodies for uh, pregnancy. And a lot of, and a lot of women notice uh, that estrogen spike because of their cervical fluid. And for me, it seems to happen. Yep. It's sort of like in the middle of my luteal phase. Yep. Yeah. yeah. And some women will experience a, a mucus or a fluid kind of throughout their luteal phase as well. So it's really about being in touch with your body, knowing what those different types of fluid look like, what they feel like, and then charting it accurately. Okay, right. And so I have another question for you, and I'm sure a lot of sure. people have questions about this, but what do you consider um, your, so do you, is it that once you've ovulated, your cervical fluid starts to dry up, or does it get, does it stay uh, uh, like the fertile cervical fluid, like the viscous egg white that you talked about? for the day of ovulation and the day after, or does it start to sure. taper off once you've ovulated? Yeah, and it kind of depends on the woman too. Okay. Um, when you're using fertility awareness as a birth control method, there are a few rules that are in place that kind of account for maybe those days afterward when you might have fertile cervical fluid still. Okay. Um, some women, they'll see a drying up pattern immediately. Some women, it'll take a day or two. It kind of just depends. Okay. All right. That makes sense. Yeah. Cause I was yep. going to say that I find that, um, for me, it seems a lot more, there's a lot more before ovulation. And then by the yep. time I ovulate, um, it's not as, it doesn't seem as, um, stretchy and viscousy and all of that. So maybe there's something right. wrong with me. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> no, I don't think so at all. The reason for that is probably because your body's pumping out the cervical fluid before so that if sperm were in your uterus, it would help it stay alive. And then once ovulation occurs, it's already there. So it's not so ah. much about like your body's trying to have cervical fluid present at ovulation. It's really before okay. that's when the sperm needs to be there I for see. pregnancy to occur. Yeah. Okay. All right. Okay. That makes sense. All right. Yep. Does, and if anyone has any questions, again, just uh, type it into the little chat box and we'll answer them. I know that this might be a lot of information and <laughs> questions. I know I'm asking a whole lot of questions. That's good. <laughs> so uh, hopefully we're covering all the bases here. So we'll move on from charting cervical fluid. And, and now you can talk a little bit about how to observe it. <clears throat> sure. Um, so I tell people anytime your undies are off, check for cervical fluid. <laughs> so that means anytime you use the restroom before you take a shower, when you're changing your clothes, um, it's kind of a, you know, funny topic or uncomfortable for some people. But um, if you just make it a habit, it becomes not as weird anymore. Um, yeah. Just anytime you're using the bathroom, um, just think, yeah. you know, what, what do I feel? And also kind of throughout your day as you're going, you know, doing whatever you're doing just taking a moment to kind of check in with that area of your body and ask yourself like do I feel wet does it feel moist do I feel dry um, mm -hmm. and that's going to give you a good indication of what's going on down there as well okay yeah that makes complete sense uh, it's so funny like you were saying body literacy you really have to become <laughs> a body detective <laughs> and yeah uh, yeah I mean talk about getting to know your body really well this is the way to do it so um, so yes, when it comes to observing <laughs> cervical fluid. All right. So nobody has any questions still. So we'll just continue to go on to discuss the technique for observing and if there's anything else that you want to talk about when it comes to cervical fluid. Okay. So I'll just read this little mm -hmm. text right here. Checking your cervical fluid is going to be a different experience for every woman. 
um, some women will find that internal checks give them the best reading. Um, so an internal check would be, of course, with clean fingers. Um, just using two fingers and doing like a swipe up into the vaginal canal and then bringing those fingers out and taking a look and seeing what you find. And for some people that's super uncomfortable, um, but you know, maybe that's the best way that you can check your uh, your cervical fluid. So it's mm -hmm. just good to give all these things a chance, you know, approach this with an open mind and, um, you know, have a sense of humor about it as well. Um, <laughs> <Yeah>. And so, <laughs> I mean, you have to, yeah, you know. Yeah, you totally have to. Are you kidding me? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> However, if you're, like, totally opposed to that, you won't do it. That's okay. Um, some women feel more comfortable using a piece of toilet paper to gather fluid, um, and that can provide an accurate check as well. Um, so, obviously, a clean piece of, piece of toilet paper, clean hands, make sure that everything is, you know, sanitary. It's a really sensitive region. Um, and then to just, you know, take a swipe, and then before you toss it in the toilet, just take a look, see what's on the toilet paper. Um, if it's a less fertile quality fluid, it will maybe kind of soak into the toilet paper. It won't really look like anything's there. But a really fertile quality egg white fluid is going to just sit right on top. Um, and you'll be able to take a look, you know, even touch it if you're feeling really adventurous. That's the best way to do it. See if it stretches, see if it's streaked, see if it's wet. You know, all these questions are really going to be beneficial for your, for your charting practice. Mm. Um, so then however you check your cervical fluid, make sure that you're mentally noting how it looks. Um, is it clear? Is it streaked? Can you see through it? Does it stretch? That's a big one for marking fertility. Um, does it feel bouncy, gummy, wet, slippery? Um, come up with your own vocabulary is what I'll tell people sometimes for describing your cervical fluid. Um, you know, if you, if you have the words, then you'll be able to really chart it accurately. That's so funny. I mean, there you. I was going to say you've come up with a lot of words. Definitely. <laughs> I know. Well, and it's amazing it's once you start there. charting it, really, once you start really looking at it, you'll see that there's a huge variety in what's, you know, coming out down there. It's it's exactly. amazing. It's really cool. Yeah, I know. It is unbelievable. I mean, for me, <laughs> and just noting, I mean, I've, I went from being the girl who used to think I had a yeast infection once a month because I had no idea sure. what this was going, what was going on down there. And uh, to, to like, knowing exactly what's going to happen pretty much every single day of my cycle so I know I'm a complete it's dork fun. yeah I know <laughs> it is it's really crazy because I mean guys just wake up every single morning with a bit of a testosterone surge and that's literally it whereas we have this entirely different amazing cyclical nature sure. and I just think that that's really cool and what a cool connecting point too I mean I just think like you know, if the majority of women were charting, how cool would it be for us to, you know, like have little conversations about like, oh, where are you in your cycle? Oh, and just, you know, to <laughs> have that so point, granola. Like, connect. <laughs> I know, seriously. I just think it's so cool. You know, there's so much like women hating kind of women sort of stuff. And I just think that would eliminate yeah. some of that. <laughs> but that's I know, it there. would. I totally agree with that. I know, I'm the same way. I talk about this to everybody. I've gotten so many friends and so many clients to do this, and they're all just fascinated by it. So many women who were on the birth control pill or on the Nuva Ring or something and so opposed to this. And they've come back to me and they're just like, I cannot believe what my body does. <laughs> yeah, I know. Isn't this the greatest thing ever? So it's if you cool just give stuff. it. Yeah, if you just give it a, t a chance to do it, it will it will really impress you. <laughs> <laughs> so, okay, well, there's still no questions. Everybody seems to be following along, I guess, very well. Yeah. Uh, so I guess we can go on to um, a couple other things that will help uh, you with um, cervical fluid or checking out cervical fluid. Sure, and I think we might have touched on these, but it doesn't yeah. hurt to repeat them again. Mm -hmm. So when you wipe your labia after using the restroom, um, you can ask yourself, does the toilet paper glide really easily? If it does, you probably have some good fertile quality fluid going on there. Um, if it doesn't, then, you know, maybe you don't. Yeah. Um, again, do you feel a wet sensation during the day, just kind of being aware? Can you see cervical fluid dried on your underwear? That's another good indication. Um, a lot of times a really fertile cervical fluid will have like a really circular kind of stain. I wear black mm -hmm. underwear all the time, so I can yeah. check this out. Um, <laughs> so do I. That's pretty and, funny. Uh, yeah, if you, mm -hmm. wear, if you wear dark underwear, you can see this. And then a, uh, a non-fertile quality fluid will leave more of like 
a streaked stain. It won't be a circular. Okay. Yeah, that makes sense. It's the water content. Right. Of course, the water content. Okay. Yeah, that makes sense. And then, of course, uh, if you're charting this and tracking, you want to make note of all of these things. <clears throat> yep. Okay. All right. So now we're going into charting your basal body temperature and uh, what that is and how one goes about doing that now that we've covered all the cervical fluid, every detail possible. Right. Oh, wait. I see, a, I see a question here really quickly. So I'll answer that or I'll have Ashley answer that. So Claire says, is the scent of cervical fluid ever an indicator of the cycle? I would probably say, um, I mean, yes, I would definitely, I wouldn't chart that as your main indication of whether mm -hmm. or not you're fertile or not, but it could definitely be used as a secondary fertility sign, and we'll kind of talk about those in a minute as well. Um, okay. But even, scent and even taste, if you're feeling really adventurous. Um, <laughs> <laughs> awesome. Really, okay. Really fertile cervical fluid will be, um, it's less acidic. Um, okay. So just so you know. <laughs> so it's, okay, right. Okay. That, so you would, so it would literally be um, more neutral tasting or something like that? Yep. Okay. Yep, see. like baking soda and water. Okay. It's pretty so funny, actually. Like I'll tell all of you that Ashley and I had pictures of cervical fluid and we thought, <laughs> well, you know, it'd be really good for us to use these photos to give all these girls an idea of of what it all looks like. And then we thought, well, you know, I don't know, we might have been pretty <laughs> traumatized a couple of years ago if that had been shown to us. So we decided against it. Um, so you'll just have to <laughs> just go with what we're saying, unfortunately. Maybe However, next time. Yeah. Once you guys photos, are more seasoned we can... veterans definitely send them yeah. to you <laughs> next time i know right we can even send them in the in the email so if you want them yeah, let us know great. we'll be happy to do that and you can just type that in the chat box okay so um does that answer your question oh somebody said they want the photos want the okay photos. cool we'll send them in the we'll send them in the follow-up email so uh, i just want to make sure does that answer your question about the scent of cervical fluid if there are any other questions about it just let us know and, and we'll continue to answer them so in the meantime, uh, we'll, we'll start with the charting of your basal body temperature. Great. So BBT, basal body temperature, it's going to change during the cycle. It'll start off low, um, usually somewhere in the low 97 range. Um, mm -hmm. And a BBT thermometer is going to do your temperature to the 10th degree, so 97.1, 97.2, etc. Um, right. So yeah, that's, that's kind of where it'll start off. That was something, sorry, I wanted to say really quickly as well. Like, and we'll talk sure. about that a little bit more with the temperatures, but that was what confused me at the beginning too. I didn't know what a basal body thermometer was. And so for everyone who doesn't know, it charts, like you said, in, in tenths of a degree rather than a regular thermometer, which I think is twentieths of a degree. Is that, that's yep. correct, right? Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. So it's just more accurate basically. Right. Yeah. All right, um, carry on. <laughs> sure. <laughs> so then again, after ovulation, progesterone kicks in, um, and you'll see a noticeable jump. In Tony Weschler's book and a lot of the other fertility awareness, um, like Teach Yourself books, it'll give you an exact number. I think it'll say like three-tenths of a degree. Mm -hmm. um, but I usually just say a noticeable jump. Yeah. Because if it's three-tenths of a degree or higher, you're going to notice it. Um, yeah. If your temperature jumps up sometime in your follicular phase and your cervical fluid isn't really lining up with it or it kind of, you know, it goes back down the next day, um, that probably wasn't an indicator of ovulation. So, um, okay. again, with the fertility awareness method, with birth control, there's a few rules that you would use. You would see the jump, you would count a number of days, and then you would consider yourself safe for the rest of the cycle. Um, okay. So temperatures will stay high after ovulation for the remainder of the cycle, which is generally 12 to 15 days. Um, if your temperature stays high for much longer than that, you're probably pregnant. Mm. Or the very rare uh, luteal cyst. You could get a cyst on your uh, corpus luteum, and then it keeps it alive longer. Oh. But uh, that's kind of rare. <laughs> oh, yeah. I've never heard of that. That's interesting. Yeah, okay. it's super interesting. Whoa. All right. Well, we don't want that. So if you know you're absolutely not pregnant and your luteal phase is longer than 16 days, you might want to go have that checked out. So see okay. another indication of, you know, how you can monitor your health without a doctor. Yeah, no, I think that that is really amazing. So for everyone who doesn't know this, your luteal phase should be anywhere from 10 to 14 days. I mean, it's almost guaranteed to be that if you're in, like yep. a normally cycling woman and you don't have any irregular periods or anything like that, 
luteal phase should always be 10 to 14 days after ovulation. That's how you can determine. Um, so when you're tracking, the day you ovulate, you just count 10 to 14 days from the, that day, and that those that will be when you get your period. Uh, so ovulation actually determines when you're getting your period, pretty much, or the date of ovulation right. determines it. So, um, and the follicular mm -hmm. phase, that first part of your cycle, is going to determine like how long your cycle is. That's the part that can kind of change with you know depending on what's going on. But your luteal phase will always, always, always be the same amount of time. Right. Yeah. Exactly. That's that, yeah, that ten to fourteen days. Right. Okay. So that's what I think is cool too is that you can know you're pregnant long before your doctor <clears throat> knows you're pregnant. <laughs> yeah. And a lot of women who chart will know will have a better idea of their due date than yeah. what the doctor gives as well. Yeah, that's um, another thing. For, that's for a... like induction reasons and all sorts of crazy stuff. Oh, come on. that's a thing. Like that's what I wanted to ask you as well. Like. And it's and I mentioned it to you, written at the, in the front of the fertility awareness book, um, that she talked about this couple who had this problem with um, with uh, the due date of their baby, and so doctors seem to calculate it quite differently to what it should be. Is that the case? Yeah, if yeah. you know when you've ovulated, you know um, you can you know calculate your due date incredibly accurately. Right. Um, the doctor does it from your last missed period, which is you know. 10 to 14 days after ovulation so right that's yeah that's why I'm always confused by that I I, I figured that it didn't it didn't add up yeah I mean oh. I'm sure there are some doctors who know better but yeah for the most part yeah it's calculated it's, <laughs> it's calculated wrong yeah. so um okay so that's pretty much what the intro to the basal body temperature I think we covered everything on this page right yeah okay yeah all right all right, so tracking your cycle again, how to take your basal body temperature. Right, so um, here's a couple pictures of a basal body thermometer. You can mm -hmm. see there's a bunch of little lines, so that's your tenth of a degree. Um, again, take your temperature the same time every day if you can. Um, if you get up later on the weekends or, you know, you sleep in a day, um, just make note of it on your chart so you know if your temperature looks a little bit higher, you know the reason why. Um, and it's good to take your BBT after at least three consecutive hours of sleep as well because if you wake up, fall back asleep for two hours and then you take your BBT, it could be off a little bit as well. And obviously it's not possible to do this perfectly all the time, so that's why it's good to make lots of really clear notes on your charts. Okay. Yeah, that makes sense. Um, and I was going to say too that, that uh, maybe you can talk a little bit about the types of thermometers because like I was saying to you, I use a digital one and, uh, and I really do question the accuracy of it. So I'm now thinking I might go and get one of these that you pictured here in the grass. Sure. So, so pretty. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I have a glass one. I'm a really big fan of it. I used a digital one for a while and the beeping was nice because I, I would always fall back asleep after I started taking my temperature and then the beeping of it woke me back up, which was good. Uh, <laughs> but with the glass one, you don't have to deal with batteries dying. You don't have to... I mean, that's the big thing, I guess, is just the batteries. Because if your batteries are dying, then your temperature is going to be off. Um, also, I just feel like the glass one's a teeny tiny bit more eco-friendly. Yeah. Oh, what? Because we're Personally. not we're not throwing away batteries. You're so green. Look right. at you. Right. We're not yeah. throwing away batteries. <laughs> and also, like, I don't know. I feel like they're more easily breakable because they're plastic, and so we're not throwing away old thermometers or anything either with the glass one you do have to shake it down which I also think is kind of fun but you want to do it before you go to bed at night because if you get up shake down your thermometer then your temperature is gonna shoot right up so okay that's the one thing um you also want to make sure you don't break it while you're shaking it which I've also done well like how does it do you find that it takes longer to use this the the uh, glass thermometer than a digital one it does, actually, yeah. The digital mm. one will take maybe like 30, 40 seconds. The glass one you have to leave in your mouth for five minutes. Oh, girl. Um, but it's yeah, everybody really nice on the to phone is like... like, no way, I have five <laughs> minutes in the morning to do this. <laughs> Heck no. <laughs> but I just set my alarm and then, you know, put the thermometer in and then that's five minutes to just kind of lay there and gather your thoughts and mm. gather your, you know, yourself get ready for the day. I don't know. It's a good yeah. little practice. 
Yes. No, I complete. I completely agree. I think that <laughs> those five minutes would be amazing for most of us to just like mm-hmm. ground and center ourselves rather yeah, than totally. be flying out of bed once the beeping right. stopped. So exactly. that, yeah, it would be really nice. Okay. So that's basically the difference. Um, so like you were saying with the digital, then essentially the main difference is, is that the battery dying uh, could read it inaccurately. Yep. The battery okay. dying and shaking it down before you go to sleep. And okay, right. Yeah, I've already dropped one and and it doesn't use <laughs> anymore. So yeah, it's really messy. Um, but anyways, okay. So uh, and then m- I had one other question about this too. If anybody has any questions about it, just let us know. Um, it was uh, that my temperatures uh, during my period tend to be like it's interesting. It drops uh, down to like ninety seven point something. So I when I'm a, the day I get my period, so I know I'm going to get it. Uh, but mm-hmm. then it sort of rises back up during my period and then drops back down again to the 97 in the 97. Yeah. So and mine actually does that as well. That's a really common thing to have happen. A lot uh, of times it'll okay. be like a little bit of leftover progesterone from the previous cycle. So right. it'll keep your temperatures a little bit higher, you know, while you're bleeding and then it'll drop back down. Mm, okay. All right. That makes sense. Uh, yeah, yeah. I was wondering about that. Um, and then, yeah, of course, and then they're low and then they go up. So and that was one other question too, actually, I just thought about. So when uh, some women ovulate, uh, the progesterone obviously kicks in and raises our temperature, but does it happen the day after ovulation for everybody or can it take longer sometimes? How does that work usually? Sure. And that kind of depends on the woman as well. And that's why the fertility awareness method has a few different checks and balances to mm. know when you're completely safe. Um, for some women, and progesterone deficiency is actually kind of like a really big thing that's going on as well. So oh, for some yeah. women, it'll even take like two or three days for the progesterone to really kick in. Um, and you'll see these things on your charts. And there's a lot of like really awesome natural things you can do to work on your luteal phase and your progesterone as well. And so fertility yeah. awareness is awesome for that. Yes. I completely agree with that. I know that's I know estrogen dominance, progesterone, or low progesterone as well. Both yeah. of those, or combined, are definitely a huge problem. Yeah, they I guess estrogen be. dominance is the really big one. It'll kind of override yeah. your progesterone. Oh, for sure. And I mean, like, you could even have relatively regular or uh, decent levels of estrogen and then have low progesterone, or you could just have high estrogen and regular progesterone. But either way, it, it definitely has... A pretty big physiological effect in our bodies. So actually, if any of you are interested, I'm doing a free teleclass on that next week. <laughs> so we could talk, well, we'll be talking a lot about estrogen dominance. So anyway, you'll find out all about that later. All right, moving along. Um, okay, let's see. So secondary signs, which I think we've been talking about a little bit here, but maybe you can right. go into some of those. Sure. These are like, maybe one of my favorite parts of the fertility awareness method, just like starting to chart these things and kind of be in touch with your body, Mm -hmm. um, being aware of what's going on. It's super exciting. Um, So the big (laughs) one that a lot of people will chart is your cervix. Um, If you're comfortable doing a cervix check, um, (laughs) yeah, that's a big one. (laughs) But um, it's usually firm and it remains lower. Um, and close throughout most of your cycle. Um, but as estrogen increases, starts those follicles to grow, gets the cervical fluid going, um, it causes the cervix to become really soft. It opens up. Um, that's like a characteristic fertile quality cervix. So um, mm. you can you can kind of line that up with the rest of your cycle. If you're feeling a really soft, open cervix, you know that ovulation is approaching. Okay. I mean, um, can you describe how does one go about doing that? I've never actually done this. Uh, I've okay. never, yeah, I've never been able to work up the nerve. <laughs> so maybe yeah, you can actually, describe it a little bit. I don't really do it um, like <laughs> regularly in my charting, but it's really interesting and I should do it more. But just make sure your hands are clean, your fingernails are clean, of course, and then um, squat and go ahead and stick your finger up there and um, you can feel it. You can feel your cervix. It's it's not too far up in the vaginal canal. Okay. Um, and this is also a good practice for women to do um, because of like cysts. You can also feel any cervical cysts that might be there. Um, there's a really, like a lot of women will have nabothian cysts, which are totally fine. There's nothing wrong with you if you have a nabothian cyst um but if you if you feel a cyst and it's you know it's still there a couple months down the road then you know you know maybe you should go get it checked out so again another way that you can 
you know, figure something out that could be bad before it gets really bad. Well, where would it be? Where would the cervical cyst be if you did have one? On the cervix. Like on the, like in the area that you were feeling? Like on the top. Yep. Okay. Um, yeah, I think, I know, I feel like we should have had a diagram, but it's so hard. <laughs> it's hard to picture it. So, um, yeah. yeah, because for me, like, you know, I feel like I've done all of this where I'm squatting and putting fingers in there and all that. And I've never, mm -hmm. I don't think I've ever felt my cervix. Never been able to find it. Well, if you do, like too far um, up there so like, if, if you guys are familiar with like doing a, a Kegel, if you like pushing that mm -hmm. area down, um, that'll help kind of push the cervix down a little bit as well. Ah, uh, yes. Right. I'll okay. Yeah. That. Of course. Okay. I'm gonna have to get on that. Uh, yep. Somebody just made a <laughs> comment really here. Oh, yeah. No. Oh, I'm sure it is. <laughs> so that's the one thing that I have. I know that that's part of a big part of the fertility awareness method. And it's the one thing that I haven't really done. So but somebody did just say here, when you palpate the cervix, it feels like you're touching the tip of your nose. And it's funny. Yeah, because that's exactly how I describe it to women in my program as well. It's like, oh, yeah, it's it 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 usually is sort of firm, like the tip of your nose and then becomes yep. soft. And so, okay, well, um, okay, I guess you can keep going. <laughs> what are the other, sure. other signs? <laughs> so there are a few other secondary fertility signs. These aren't, um, you know, like you wouldn't count on these necessarily for, you know, tracking your ovulation, but they're just fun things to kind of note. So around ovulation, some women will also notice tender breasts, a pain in one side. Um, that's usually called middle schmerz, which literally means middle pain in German. Mm. And it's the the pain of the egg actually coming through the ovarian wall. Um, some women will experience clear skin. Um, some women will experience more vivid dreams, higher sex drive, increased creativity, all yeah. sorts of fun women, feminine things. I love that. I, you know, and I talk a lot about this when I talk about the four phases of the cycle because the, the time around, you know, right before ovulation, ovulation, and then right after it. It's really an amazing time. We, you know, we're, we have uh, better uh, sort of verbal skills, all of these different things. It's incredible. And it has to do mm -hmm. with our high levels of estrogen and testosterone during that time, as you know. But uh, a lot of people don't realize this, that, you know, we have a high, we're able to, we have like a higher tolerance for lots of exercise around this time. And uh, we're really right. good in, uh, you know, doing meetings and speaking up and we're a little bit bolder. And then, of course, we have a higher sex drive, which is great too. <laughs> so, right. yeah, there's like a <laughs> lot of really cool side, things. During mm. your period, when your hormones are so low, um, that makes sense. You know, if during your period you're feeling a little bit sluggish, or you know, like you're not getting the words out right, or you're having trouble speaking, or you know, whatever. It, it, a lot of it has to do with hormonal kind of stuff. So of that's course. just a good thing to be aware of too. Instead of being like, oh man, I really, you know, messed up this fertility awareness meeting that I gave today <laughs> instead of saying that it's like oh well my hormones are a little bit low so it's that's okay. so true it's yeah valid <laughs> it is I know you know it's funny that this is uh something that's talked about by uh, women health uh, leaders and things like that they talk a lot about using your cycle to sort of maximize your life and I talk about this as well and I really try to do that I'm not doing it right now because I'm about to get my period so <laughs> hopefully I sound okay but uh, for the most part you know uh, scheduling your life around um, the more active phases of your of your cycle is a really great way to sort of maximize your time your life all these things Absolutely. because yeah and then sort of winding down towards uh, your period that last half of your luteal phase it's it makes so much sense. And once you start to pay attention, especially to your to charting in your cycle, that's that's totally the way to live your life. Right. Yeah. And you'll start to find like little patterns throughout your cycle as well. Like for me, I know on day 20, 21, 22, usually around there, I need to be by myself. If I'm hanging out with my husband or friends or parents or anything, it's like, oh my God, I can't stand you guys right now. And I know it's just because <laughs> like whatever, for whatever reason, hormonally something weird is going on and I just have to like kind of retreat and have some time to myself and read and journal um mm -hmm. and so instead of like having giant fights at that time in my period which I which used to happen now I just know like this is what I need to do and then you know my life goes on a little bit more smoothly so so yeah really it's so true 
<laughs> so true. <laughs> oh, man. Okay, if anybody has any questions, please feel free to ask. So now I wanted to just ask you a little bit about your book recommendations and all of these, again, by the way, ladies, this will all be sent to you as well, the links to these three books and all the rest of the things that we've talked about. Right. So these are my three favorites. Well, actually, that's not true. They're all my favorites, but <laughs> these are three good ones. <laughs> Garden of Fertility by Katie Singer. She teaches you how to chart. Um, she also has a lot of really good um, like nutritional kinds of pieces and environmental things. Um, she talks a little bit about lunaception, which is like using lighting with your period. It's kind of hippy-dippy, but <laughs> also very cool. <laughs> um, taking really charge of cool. your fertility. Yeah, it's, mm -hmm. it's cool. Yes. Um, the Tony Weschler book, um, she's kind of like the goddess of charting your fertility um, as far as I'm concerned. She just came mm -hmm. out with her 10th anniversary edition of the book, which is awesome. Is it updated? Um, is it revised? Uh, yes, it's revised, and she's also working on, like, another revision right now. Oh, so awesome. She's just, like, constantly cranking out good stuff, so uh -huh. definitely check out her. Um, and then Her Blood is Gold by Laura Owen um, was one of my favorite books that I read in my class. She talks a lot about um, making your menstrual cycle kind of like a ritual, mm -hmm. um, really, like, seeing the specialness and the um, you know, like how it's sacred and beautiful and wonderful and really empowering. So I would definitely recommend that if you're interested in, you know, looking at your cycle in a different way. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, I think that we, there's so many of us who view it as a curse. And so if we yeah. could just sort of shift that perspective a little bit, uh, then it would, it would change a lot of things. I know Lara Owen's other book. Um, gosh, what's it called again? Uh, darn, I can't remember. Um, I read it a long time ago. It was written a really long time ago, and uh, and it's such a good book. It's all about, again, I, I think it's very much interrelated to this one, Her Blood is Gold, and it's all about the tradition and history and the idea of, you know, syncing up to your moon, to the moon cycle and all of that kind mm -hmm. of stuff. So, uh, again, um, if any of you are interested in these books, they really are amazing reads, and uh, and they will help you tremendously in this journey of tracking and charting your cycle. So now I wanted to tell you all a little bit about Ashley's special offer. She has a fertility awareness for birth control um, series, and she's going to be starting it on April 25th. So I'll let her tell you a little bit more about that. Sure. So this would be the full class. Um, if you take this, I would definitely say you'd be ready for charting and using the fertility awareness method for birth control. Um, it would be a three class series. Um, plus one private chart review a few months later. So after you've charted a little bit, we would go over your charts and um, talk about any questions that you might have. Um, we're going to cover female anatomy, male anatomy, hormones of the menstrual cycle. We'll go more in depth with that. How to chart your BBT, cervical fluid, and then the big one would be the rules for preventing pregnancy. Mm -hmm. um, so it'll be a small class size. It'll be over Google Hangouts, um, which is really fun. Uh, there'll yeah. be a private inst instruction session. I'll have tons of handouts and charts and um, yeah, you'll get to learn the method. That's really also, awesome. Um, it'll be the first actual official class that I'll be teaching. So my teacher will be there as well as kind of like a guide. Um, so you'll get to be present with me as I embark on my fertility awareness educator journey. I love it. I think it's great. And Ashley's also offering a discount. So it's $70 for anyone who is signed up for this webinar or on this webinar. And uh, so again, I think it's an amazing deal for three classes, hour and a half long classes. Um, like I said, it's only $70. And I, I actually feel like I want to take this class. So <laughs> I feel like I know quite a bit now, but I'm sure there's <laughs> plenty more to learn. So if any of you are interested in this, again, I will include all of this information in the follow-up email, uh, but email ashley at lovely.fertility.class at gmail.com. And again, you can also send an email to me and I'll forward it on to her if, if you don't get this email address in time or anything like that. Uh, but again, I feel like it's a kind of an amazing offer. And uh, so if any of you are interested, just let us know. Definitely. So, um, I, Ashley, is there anything else you wanted to add? I just thought about this and I know like this was the first time that we've done this and I, I think we'll do it again uh, because there was a tremendous amount of interest in it. Um, but we didn't have an actual picture of a chart. <laughs> ah. 
<laughs> yeah, I know. <laughs> kind of messed that up. Sorry about that. Well, uh, I can so. I can send you my chart that I use, and maybe you could attach it to the email that goes out. With Absolutely. The... Yeah, I can definitely okay, do that. That would be that. great. Yeah, so everyone can see what Ashley's chart looks like. And uh, so sorry about that. But again, it's very much like what she was saying in that your temperatures tend to be lower before ovulation and then higher after ovulation. And you you start to, and when you look at the big picture, it's not so much about the daily temperatures. It's about the um, the sort of the pattern, the lower versus the high pattern. Is that that's pretty right. much it, right? Yep. Yeah. Absolutely. Okay. Um, so anybody else have any questions or anything like that? Uh, please let us know. Um, it's just a couple minutes now until our 60 minute time limit is up. So That's if so there fast. are, just let us know. And if not, that's okay too. Uh, you can send um, questions to, to respond to questions to me. I will include all of Ashley's information as well. So you'll be able to send her an email. I know that like, this is a very personal private subject. And so <laughs> a lot of people aren't very comfortable talking about it on live, whatever. <laughs> so I know I find that all the time. Women are like, no, I can't be a part of your you know, your group or whatever, because everybody on Facebook will see it <laughs> or whatever, something like that. So I'm like, I know, I totally get it. Um, but again, I just want to thank you all so much for being here today with us. And uh, hopefully we'll be able to do this again in a couple of months when, um, when, you know, you have that first class under your belt and we can, we can delve more deeply into it. That would be great. Yeah, it would be. So I don't see any questions from anyone here. We can stick around for a little bit longer, maybe another okay. minute or so, and see if anyone has any questions. But if not, then uh, I guess we're we're pretty much done for the day. So, um, so Ashley, how was that? Did you enjoy it? Yeah, that was great. Super 